You don't want to be identified with any of those groups, am I right? Like you wouldn't say that you're a person that's on the right or the left or conservative or really, I noticed you didn't say no, whether well, or my, not you believed in God. Well, my political views are complicated because I'm temperamentally liberal. This video was requested by someone leaving a comment, Shaul Kramer. So thank you, Shaul, for this suggestion. He'd actually suggested that I do the, the second Russell Brand video, which, which I am not doing. <laughs> I'm doing the first one. It's less about politics and more about sort of spirituality and philosophy. Mr. Reagan. You don't want to be identified with any of those groups, am I right? Like you wouldn't say that you're a person that's on the right or the left or conservative or really, I know you didn't say no, well, whether my, or not you believed in God. Well, my political views are complicated because I'm temperamentally liberal because I'm high in openness, which is a creativity dimension. And people who are high in openness tend to be liberal because they they like free flowing information and they like, uh, what would you say? fluid boundaries because information can move back and forth across the boundaries. How amazing. So, a lot of people debate whether or not Jordan Peterson is a true Christian or he's a conservative or liberal. Whenever I post anything about Jordan Peterson, a lot of comments, there are often people saying, he's not a conservative. Why do you keep referring to him as a conservative or right wing? He's not. He's a liberal. He constantly talks about himself as a liberal. And here he says he has a liberal temperament. Everything that Jordan Peterson talks about supports ideas that conservatives have been fighting for for decades. Everything he talks about reinforces ideas that Christians have believed since the time of Christ. Jordan Peterson supports Christian ethics and conservative ideas. Whether or not he labels himself as a conservative, that is the world in which he operates. Those are the things that he is promoting. So to say that he's not a conservative I think is a little bit disingenuous. To say that he's a liberal is just flat out wrong. Some people say, well, he's a classic liberal. I don't see a distinction. Classic liberal and conservative are essentially the same thing in 2018. You've got the same fundamental philosophies, but I do, I do think that Jordan Peterson rejects being labeled or rejects being boxed into any one group. And I think that there's there's possibly a couple of reasons for that, and I'd like to explore that. So one tactic that's used not only by the left, but by the right as well, is to minimize, minimize the apparent power of an opponent by simplifying everything that they believe and, and state into a neat little package that's easily digestible for the opposition. So if you say, well, this person's a conservative, anybody who hates conservatives and hates conservative ideas will then put all of these preconceptions onto that person. They'll say, okay, well, I get that person. I know where they're coming from. I understand everything about them and I can easily dismiss them now. Same thing with with like, oh, this person's a Christian, right? This is why Philip Dodd kept, kept trying to say, you're an American Protestant. So you're clearly a North American Protestant. He's trying to fit him into a little tiny box that he can say, look, everybody, he's just an American Protestant. There's nothing new here. He's not interesting. He's not innovative. He's not intelligent. He's just regurgitating old things that other people have said in the past, and we can just dismiss his ideas. The more complex your ideas, the more sophisticated your arguments, the more difficult it is to just put you into a box. And Jordan Peterson utterly rejects being put into a box. And I totally respect that. In fact, it's not only accurate, but I think it's a smart thing for him to reject because he can't be diminished. He can't be dismissed as X, right? He's just X. He's just Y. He's dismissible. No, he's not dismissible because you don't quite understand him. If, if you don't quite understand somebody, if you can't just put their ideas into a little nice little package and say, oh yeah, you know, I, I totally get this. If you can't do that, then you have to actually listen to the person. You have to actually investigate what they really think. And that's a lot of work and people don't like to do that. They like to have everything sort of like prepackaged for them so that they can either dismiss it or accept it as easily as possible. And I don't think Jordan Peterson wants people to do that. I think Jordan Peterson wants people to listen to all of his ideas, the details in those ideas, and then make up their minds on their own. Earlier in this interview, he talks about how you shouldn't see yourself as an ideologue. You shouldn't see yourself as a nihilist. You should think, think of yourself as an ever-changing entity, right? You're always growing. You're always changing. You're always learning new things. And therefore, I think he partially rejects the idea of being labeled because how can you label something that's ever-changing? It's very difficult to do. So if he genuinely believes that he himself is this ever-changing type of being, then to label him would be disingenuous. It would be inaccurate. And I think he strives for accuracy. I think he strives for precision. We'll get precise. And I do think he genuinely believes all this stuff. So his rejection of, of the various labels that are, are given to him is a natural thing for him to do. I think it's accurate and I think it's smart. But that said, I do think he's a conservative. I do think he's a Christian. That's what I think. Maybe I'm wrong. You're probably going to disagree. I'll probably get a lot of hate 
in the comment section, but that's what I think. I suppose all of these forms, the idea that there could perhaps be some kind of golden rule, seem to infer a oneness, a truth, that may be expressed as the idea of God, wholeness, oneness. Uh, where do you, where do you stand on the uh, do you uh, do you believe in God? Well, the the Jungian idea is that that there's not much distinction between what Jung described as the archetype of the self and the idea of God, the totality of your being across time. There's a part of people that's the self, the Jungian self, that is capable of sustaining itself across successive deaths and rebirths. When you're moving through life and you have a plan or a dream and it shatters, and you learn something profound as a consequence, and you put yourself back together, and when you come back out, you're more than you were when you went in. And that's happening in, at a small scale. Every time you learn something, you know, you, if you ever really learn something, it's usually painful. It usually means that you have to recognize that you're wrong in some important way. You have to let that part of you that's wrong die. Here's another way of thinking about it. You could identify with what you understand. That's what ideologues do. Huh. You could identify with, you don't, with what you don't understand, and that's what sort of seekers after truth um, uh, identify with. Or you could identify with the process of moving between those states. You know, sometimes you know what you're doing, you know where you are, you, you, you're, you're in control, and you can become arrogant and identify with that and then become too static about it, right? Or you can be in despair and everything is chaotic and you can identify with that, in which case you're nihilistic. Or you can view yourself as the thing that moves across the transformations. And that's, that's the right way to, to, to conceptualize yourself, is you're the thing that m maintains constancy across transformations. This is all fairly interesting. I do think a lot of people think they know everything, ideologues, and then other people just assume that they know nothing and they can never really know anything, nihilists. And, and the correct way to see yourself is constantly changing. I, I think that's an interesting idea. I think that human beings in contemporary society, and perhaps all through time, tend to have layers of personalities, like the proverbial onion. We have our core self, which is the most important part of us. It's the part of us that we consider to be our true self. That core version of us, we do tend to protect. We all put on layers of personality that are similar, or maybe an extension of our core personality, but different enough to where if somebody attacks that layer, if somebody ridicules us, they're ridiculing the layer, they're not ridiculing our core self. So I think we have a core self that we may never share with anybody. Beyond that, we have the personality that everybody who is very, very close to us knows. And then beyond that, friends that we're not super close to. Beyond that, maybe business associates. Beyond that is the personality that we express when we're at parties with strangers and things like this. And then of course, beyond that is the shell that we put up when we go out in public. A lot of people on the London subway, like a permanent scowl, don't effing talk to me. Nevertheless, everybody has these layers of protection to protect that core self. And I don't think that that core self changes very easily. I think typically what happens is you have ideas and beliefs that very much parallel this kind of layering effect where you have things that are core to your, your belief system and then you have things on the outskirts of your belief system that aren't so important to who you believe you are. Those can be fairly easily manipulated, fairly easily changed, and then those might change something that's a little closer to you and a little closer to you and eventually your core may shift a little bit one way or the other as you start to recognize truths that are pushing your perspective in different ways but, but on the peripheral, you know, on, you know, things that aren't that important to you. And so, yeah, I do think that we're constantly transforming, but I think it's a very slow process. It happens incrementally, and I think it happens with the things that are less important to us first before, you know, we allow ourselves to expose our core to these, to these drastic changes. Because changing your core self is an incredibly scary process because I think that we, we consider that to be sacred. I think most people think that of their core selves as sacred, not to be touched, right? And that's why we build up these layers. So I do, I do agree with him. As an addendum to that, I would say that it happens piecemeal. We're not like liquid constantly flowing and changing into new. It's not so easy as that. The way, I'm not saying that he thinks it's easy. I just think that the way he expressed it makes it sound like the changes that happen to us throughout our lifetimes are easy and consistent. And I don't think they're either.
While we're in the Old Testament, I want to ask you something else from the book of Job that seems right up your alley. I looked at this book, it was a book of engravings from the book of Job by the British writer and poet William Blake. Mm -hmm. Blake had done this series of engravings based on the trials and tests that Job went through. Yep. Now, the thing that struck me deep, 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 and I've been struggling with it ever since, is there's a moment where Yahweh shows the behemoth and the leviathan to Job. And he says, these I made as mm. I made thee. Right. And then in this Jungian analysis of these engravings, the writer says that, the, that God requires of us that we be good, that goodness itself may exist. This idea of agency and God, this relationship between the unmanifest and the manifest as achieved through an individual's relationship with truth and expression, seemed to me that it was saying something that was right on the precipice of my ability to understand and certainly to convey. So Job is objecting to his treatment because, of course, God has a bet with the devil, basically, that he can take Job down and make him curse fate. But then you also wove in into the question this idea of the ethical requirement to be good. Yeah. And that's, there's something in that that's unutterably deep because this is... This is right at the limit of my ability to understand things, too. So it's speculative beyond belief. But it seems to me that we are thrown challenges and that, they're, that, and that in some sense those are best construed as tests of our ethical ability. So what Jung thought, his idea was something like this, that at the beginning of time people were unconscious and that consciousness emerged with all of its catastrophes, consciousness of death, for example. And one way out of the burden of consciousness was to return to unconsciousness. You can do that with alcohol. You can do that by being dependent. You can do that by failing to grow up. You refuse the burden of consciousness by becoming unconscious again. But there's another way for it, which is to become even more conscious. And Jung believed that that was, that was one of the ideas that ran through the entire structure of Judeo-Christianity, although not it wouldn't be limited to Judeo-Christianity. So it's it's more consciousness rather than less. It's more attention. And I, I, think, I think there's something to that. When you're trying to lead people forward out of the darkness, let's say, um, out of anxiety and depression and despair and, and resentment and bitterness and anger and all of those things, catastrophic interactions with their family, is that you get them to stop avoiding confronting the terrible things that are in front of them. Right. So basically what you do, instead of saying to them, you know all those terrible things that are happening? Just ignore those and, and, and find some peace, right? Get your mind away from it. That isn't what you say. You say, turn around and look at them even more than you've been looking at them. It's very paradoxical advice, but of all the things that have been proven to aid people's recovery and movement towards mental health, that's like at the top of the list. Voluntary confrontation with what you are afraid of or, or what you despise even for that matter. And so Jung had an axiom that he derived from the alchemist, which was insterquilinus invenitur, which meant, roughly meant, that which you most need will be found where you least want to look. Which is, fuck oh, man. Yeah. Well, that's, yeah, that was also his explanation for why people weren't enlightened. Because you think, well, the California approach to enlightenment, to speak, you know, kind of satirically, is follow your bliss. It's like, well, that's easy. If that was the case, everyone would be enlightened. But the Jungian approach is, no, no, no. You do what's meaningful and, and pay attention, follow the truth, and it will take you to the worst place you can imagine. And then maybe there's some chance for enlightenment. Campbell somewhat revoked that uh, I follow your bliss ma uh, mantra, though, by saying he wish he'd said follow your blisters. You know, like the, what yeah. you should follow <laughs> is the pain. Yeah. And, and like, um, yeah. I didn't know he said that. Yeah, it's oh. cool, isn't it? Well, yeah, yeah. wicked. Put that on the scoreboard. Oh, that's good. That's like, good. And, uh, I'm not sure exactly what Russell Brand's question is here. God requires of us that we be good, that goodness itself may exist. This idea of agency and God seemed to me that it was saying something that was right on the precipice of my ability to understand and certainly to convey. My perspective is fundamentally Christian. The Christian idea of earth is sort of like going to college. God says in the Bible, I knew you before you were born.
This suggests that souls are born in some other plane of existence, and we are then transported to our corporeal forms here on Earth. We're born as little babies, and then we are raised into a fully grown human, and then we die and then go to either to heaven or hell. So Earth is a sort of a place where we develop sort of an incubator for the fully formed soul. And it's here where we make our decision. Do we want to be close to God or do we want to reject God? Right? I mean, everything in the Bible is about making a decision to follow the will of God or to reject the will of God. That's it. That's everything. Now, I, I am grateful for my life. So I feel like I should always do what I am supposed to do, what I am meant to do, what God's will is for me out of a sense of duty to God who I believe created. This is a display of gratitude. That's not to say that I always succeed in this. I am as much a sinner as anyone, if not more. But that's not to say I don't try. I try desperately to do the right thing all the time. And that's really the only agency we have in this world. We could attempt to succeed. We could allow ourselves to just be lazy and do nothing. But at the end of the, the day, those things are fairly meaningless because luck has a lot to do with that. The only thing that we can really succeed or fail in on our own terms is whether or not we do the right thing. We accept God's will and attempt to do good, or we reject God and we permit ourselves to do bad. This is the, this is the only true agency I think we have on this earth. And I think that the answer to Russell Brand's question is simply is simply that we must either choose to respect God or reject God. And that is the Christian idea. I have this sort of strong feeling that I am supposed to make myself available for the vulnerable, mm -hmm. for the powerless and for the voiceless. Mm -hmm. So that's a fine idea. This the is the one is how do you do it? How do we do it? Because it's hard to do it. Huge bloody question. Sometimes mm -hmm. they don't want me interfering in their well, lives. there is that. Majority of the time. The thing about compassion is it's not sufficient to produce solutions. Russell Brand feels compelled to give voice to the vulnerable, but in his experience, they don't want his help. Okay, I can explain to Russell Brand why this is happening exactly. The people who claim to be victims are rarely the real victims. Russell Brand has fallen for the same con as every genuinely altruistic liberal falls for. There are these groups that say, we're the victims. Oh, you know, we, we need equality. We need help. We need equality. And he goes and he tries to lend voice to them. He tries to help them out. And they go, what, what are you doing? Because they don't really want equality. They want something else. When I was a, a kid, my parents were driving us home from some kind of sport thing or something. And we'd gone to dinner at like a pizza place. And we had like half a pizza left. It was probably like pepperoni and olives or something like that. So we stopped at this stop stoplight and there's a homeless guy there with a sign that said, you know, I'm hungry. Could you spare a dollar? Something like that. So my dad grabs this pizza in the pizza box, much to my dismay because I really wanted this pizza. <laughs> and, he, and, he, and he gives it to the guy. He rolls down his window, hands it to the guy. I remember this very clearly. The guy takes the pizza box, opens it up, closes it back up, hands it back to my dad and says, I don't like olives. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> my girlfriend's laughing. And I just thought to myself, pick the olives off if you're really hungry. I mean, it's delicious food, it's pizza. But this guy wasn't actually hungry. He just had a sign that said, I'm hungry. Look, I'm vulnerable, look, I'm, I'm hungry. No, he just wanted money. He just wanted money for drugs or alcohol. He didn't need money for food. He wasn't hungry. He wasn't going hungry. So like magicians have misdirection. That's what these guys are doing, right? It's a con. It's a con. It's a it's a confidence scheme, right? They're 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 trying to get people's sympathy so that they can then con them out of their money. So these groups like Black Lives Matter, feminists, environmentalists, a lot of these kinds of people, they're saying, "Look, we need equality. We need equality." They don't really need equality. What they want is power, influence, money, fame, attention. They want something other than the equality that they're screaming for because they have equality. And the reality is there are real victims out there. There are people who are genuinely vulnerable. What Russell Brand needs to do is do some research and actually figure out who the really vulnerable people are, who the real victims are in the world. If he genuinely feels this compulsion to help the vulnerable, go figure out who the vulnerable are. Those who cry victim are almost never the real victims in society. In an unequal system, yeah. whilst there are many people that are suffering, there are some people that are benefiting. I'm in a tier that benefits. Yes. I drive a nice car, I yeah. have a nice house, I go where I want. Well, let's look at that for a minute. If you think about how that happened in your life, I, I bet I can tell you how it happened. Go on. Because you were successful in that dimension, all sorts of opportunities came your way. 
Like my suspicions are that where you're sitting now, you have more opportunities than you can deal with. Is, yeah. it, is that correct? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, right. Well, opportunities. Right, exactly. Well, there, see, this is part of what seems to drive inequality is that as you get successful, the opportunities that come your way start to multiply and they don't multiply linearly, they multiply exponentially. When you start moving up, you start moving up faster and faster and faster and faster. And then you'll hit a point where you have so many opportunities that you don't even know what to do with them. The downside of that is, let's say you start to get depressed and then you start to drink because you're depressed. And because you're drunk and depressed, then your friends start to abandon you and then you lose your job. It's like, you're not going downhill in a straight line. You're going downhill faster and faster and faster till you fall off a cliff. And that seems to be what's driving inequality. You start to succeed and the probability that you'll continue to succeed starts to expand. Mm. And so, and we don't know how to control that. The same thing happens to cities. A small proportion of the cities get all the people. Some cities grow like mad and others fail catastrophically, like Detroit. It applies to the mass of stars. So there's a very few stars in the, in the Milky Way that have most of the matter. It applies to the height of trees in the, in the jungle. This is something that Jordan Peterson talks about a lot, the Pareto distribution, and it's fascinating. This is the kind of phenomenon that encourages me to promote the, the acceptance of cultural, racial, gender, and, and other genetic differences, and encourages me to discourage people from identifying themselves by their various demographic groups. For instance, right, um, the, the classic IQ tests that are distributed around the world have indicated um, significant racial disparities in terms of IQ, you know, on average. Black sub-Saharan Africans being the, the lowest by a significant margin um, in terms of IQ. I think that that difference should be recognized and investigated. But you shouldn't have an emotional response to this data. This data needs to be accepted uh, for certain certain social and political policies, but then on an individual level, you should simply aspire to rise above the average or distinguish yourself in some other way. There's no reason to look at a cultural phenomenon and say, well, I fit neatly into that because I'm from that culture. No, you say, look, like for instance, I'm white. We don't have the highest IQ. Asians have the highest IQ. And above them, Ashkenazi Jews. I don't sit here and think, that's racist. Ashkenazi Jews aren't smarter than me. If that's true, on average, I mean, there are some dumb white people out there. I'm sorry, there just are. They're gonna bring down the numbers significantly. That doesn't mean there's no smart white people. And, you know, the distribution may be skewed a little bit to the left for black uh, sub-Saharan Africans. But it doesn't mean there can't be incredibly high IQ black people. If you're one of those high IQ black people, just, just take pride in knowing you're a smart person. My particular group has a lower IQ than Asians and Ashkenazi Jews, but I don't give a crap because my IQ is super high, at least according to the highly respected website that I found via a Facebook post. No group phenomenon should ever dictate your own individual character. Take pride in yourself as an individual, not as a part of some demographic group. You were right. You were right. You said earlier in, in the last question, well, you can't ignore the group classification problem. You know, there's a black experience. There's a Latino experience. There's a female experience. It's like, yeah, that's true. But you have to decide what level of analysis you're going to make primary. And I think the primary level of analysis is the individual and the psychological rather than the group and the sociological. And I think if you put the individual level first, and you, then you alluded to that, because you know, it, was, it was like an intuition that you were bringing forward, which was your intuition has been that the right level of progress is made at the level of the individual. And I think that's true. I thought that's the only level where I have personal authority. That's the well, only... right! The problem of inequality is an anthropological, uh, biological, physical cosmological, yeah, physical right. problem. It's, it's, a, it's a really deep problem. It's, it's a, a real deep, deep problem. problem. And for me, yeah. whenever you get near a problem that has that level of profundity or ubiquity, the solution can only be spiritual. We have to access the transcendent in some way to look for solutions. And although that sounds a so, little well, airy so fairy. So why do you believe that? Why do you believe that? I mean, I'm not disputing that, but you obviously believe that. I do believe Why? this. What, what drove you to that conclusion? I've been driven to this conclusion by the experiences of personal failure and personal limitation, by the failure of individuation, by the failure of, of my own grandiosity, the failure of my own ego, the failure of fame and power and money and sex and drugs, the, the inability of them to reach me in the belly of the beast, deep, deep, deep down where the Leviathan is. This, these cures, this alchemy was redundant. And what I have realized,
I think the spir the spiritual journey for me, the hero's journey, and like, you know, I'm using reference points in which you are a, an expert and a professor, is that, that the death of the small S self and the realization of the capital S self means become a servant, become a servant of good. Use your abilities to generate the maximum amount of love, the maximum about of, amount of kindness and compassion, and to be alert to where I can be of most use. Now for me that can be incredibly limited because I'm still a deeply egotistical, narcissistic, flawed, failing individual. But what my focus is, what my intention is, what I'm trying to learn to become in this journey of self-realization is a compassionate and loving man. And I but want to be- But you also said, you added something to that too though. Me. Well, you added useful to that. Yeah, useful is right. not well, useful, useful is you're a finished. Bit, well, that's it. So the best definition of Christian compassion that I ever read was useful and generous. Mm. Right, useful and generous. Mm. Russell Brand found unfulfilling the pleasures afforded to him by the material world, so he went searching for fulfillment in spirituality. But he rejected the faith of his ancestors and embraced the Indian religion of Hinduism. I tend to find that Westerners reject Christianity for Eastern religion for one of two reasons. Either they've had some kind of traumatic experience with regard to Christianity or Western culture in some way, or they are simply a sort of like an exoticist, right? They prefer the exotic. They prefer the idea of, of, of the different, of the, you know, there is something very mysterious about foreign ideas and foreign things. This is uh, why chinoiserie became such a popular thing in Europe uh, for hundreds of years um, and still remains um, a fascination for people today. Uh, Shinwazari being the sort of aesthetic of the Orient applied in the West by Westerners. This kind of fascination with the other, with the outside world, that with uh, the sort of mystical, mysterious realm of other cultures. I mean, that's a reasonable thing to experience. Lots of people do. I, I do in some ways. The danger in this is that if you reject, say, capitalism as part of your rejection of your own your own culture, sometimes what you're rejecting is actually right. Oftentimes as kids, you know, we become teenagers and we start to think our parents are idiots and we reject everything that our parents believe and like. A lot of kids become liberal because their parents are conservative and then they realize later in life, crap, my parents were right. I think that that's what's happened with Russell Brand here, except instead of his parents, he's rejected all of Western civilization. And he's rejected the familiar idea of capitalism because he sees the flaws in capitalism. It's easy to see the flaws in the familiar. The things you're familiar with, you're going to be able to see them in detail. The things that are unfamiliar to you are going to seem mysterious and fantastic and dazzling and it's not until you completely envelop yourself in that culture are you going to start to see the flaws in it. I think Russell Brand's rejection of Western ideas is a huge mistake, specifically capitalism. Along that same line, his rejection of Christianity is actually even more irrational and more harmful to his spiritual journey. All right, listen, we've got to wrap up because I can feel the technological angst in a, <laughs> a variety of ways. But uh, Dr. Jordan Peterson, or Professor Jordan Peterson, I don't know what, what, how to big you up enough with the, with your prologue. Um, thank you, or title. Thank you very much. I've really found it a fascinating conversation. Well, thank you. Have it you was enjoyed a great it? Conversation. Yeah, it was really, it's um, good, I wasn't really it? Appreci appreciated the invitation. It isn't the easiest Jordan Peterson interview to digest, but there is value here, and I do think that they, they stumbled upon some interesting topics. I think Russell Brand has very specific things that he's interested in talking to people about, and they're not necessarily the same things that I'm interested in talking about, but they are interesting non non nonetheless, and it was, it, was, it was an interesting watch. I'm definitely looking forward to doing the second one. Anyway, if you like this video, hit the like button. If you want to see more like it, please subscribe, and if you hate me, at least I don't wear my hair like a samurai. But somehow, Russell Brand makes it work. Good night. Winston Churchill said the destiny of man is not measured by material computations. When great forces are on the move in the world, we learn we're spirits, not animals. And he said there's something going on in time and space and beyond time and space, which whether we like it or not, spells duty.